Because we're seeing globalization as this healing path, a structural path that would enable the majority of human beings to have that foundation of human scale structures, human scale community and connection to, to the living world. It's, it would be far cheaper, it would be far easier to shift the current system where taxes, subsidies and regulations are pushing us in exactly the opposite direction. If governments can be made to shift to support human beings and to support their well-being and the well-being of the planet and with it reduce dramatically the gap between rich and poor, with it restore some hope of genuine democracy. Anyway, so everything you say just fits right into supporting everything that we're trying to promote. You know, there's an example of a place, you know, I think you can tell from the way I talk about it that I learned a lot from scientists and doctors and my yeah. journey to write lost connections, yeah. but actually the people who taught me the most about this subject were not scientists and doctors. It was a group yeah. of people who I think really fit with your thesis very powerfully. And if it's okay, I'll just tell you their story. Yeah. Um, so in the summer of 2011, on a big anonymous housing project in Berlin, a Turkish German woman named Nuria Cengiz climbed out of her wheelchair and she put a sign in her window. Nuria lived on the ground floor and the sign said something like, I got a notice saying I'm going to be evicted from my apartment next Thursday. So on Wednesday night, I'm going to kill myself. Now this housing project is a place called Cotti. It's a very poor part of Berlin. And uh, for a long time, um, it basically only three groups of people had lived there. There were recent Muslim immigrants like this woman, Nuria. There were gay men and there were punk squatters. And as you can imagine, these three groups did not get along, but no one knew anyone. It was a completely isolated place, a huge amount of depression and anxiety. Um, and people started to walk past Nuria's window. No one knew her and they saw this sign and people knocked on her door and they said, oh, do you, do you need any help? Mm. And Nuria said, no, fuck you. I don't want any help. I'm going to kill myself. Right. Now, in, in this, like in the whole of Berlin, in this housing project, um, there had been rising rents for a really long time. A lot of people were being evicted. So a lot of people, you know, really identified with this, this, this woman's struggle. And people started talking outside her apartment one day. And they had an idea. There's a big thoroughfare that goes through this housing project, through Cotty. And, and they had this idea, you know, if we just block the road for a day and we have a protest, um, there'll be a bit of a fuss. They'll probably let Nuria stay. There might even be some pressure to keep our rents down across the city, right? Like, or in, uh, on our housing project. So Saturday came, they blocked the road. Uh, they wheeled Nuria out. She said, well, I'm going to kill myself. I might as well let these people push me into the middle of the street. <laughs> and, and they had a protest and the media did come and it was a bit of a news event in Berlin that day. And then it got to the end of the day and uh, the police said to them, OK, you've had your fun. Take it down. Right? Take this barri barricade down. And the people who lived at Cotty said, well, you haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. Actually, we'll take this barricade down when Nuria gets a guarantee she can stay and we get a rent freeze for our entire housing project. But of course, they knew the minute they walked away from this barricade, the police would just tear it down and that would be the end of it. So one of my favourite people at Cotty, a woman called Tanya Gartner, who's one of the, the punk squatters, she wears tiny little mini skirts even in Berlin winters. Um, Tanya had an idea. She, she went up to her apartment and she had a klaxon, you know, those things that make loud noises at soccer matches. Yeah. Came down, she said, OK, here's what we're going to do. We can drop a timetable to man this barricade 24 hours a day until we've got Guarantee Nuri gets to stay. We've got a rent freeze for all of us. Um, and we're not going to stop until we've got what we demand, right? So people start signing up to man this barricade. People who would never have met. So Tanya, in her tiny little punk miniskirt, got paired up with Nuria, who's a very religious Muslim in a full hijab. Mm. And they got, if I remember right, they got the Thursday night shifts. And the first few nights they sit there, they were like... This is awful. We've got nothing to talk about. We couldn't have less in common. This is terrible. As the nights went on, Tanya and Nuria started talking. They realised they had something incredibly powerful in common. Mm. Nuria had come to Berlin when she was 15 years old from a village in Turkey. 16, sorry. 16 years old. 
uh, with, with two small babies. And she was meant to earn enough money to send back home for her husband in Turkey to come and join her. Mm. And she was there for a year and a half. She worked every job she could. She was looking after her babies as best she could. And then sitting there in the cold in Cotty with Tanya, she told her something she'd never told anyone in Germany before. She'd always told people that her husband, she got word then that her husband in Turkey had died of a heart attack. In fact, she told Tanya he died of tuberculosis, which was seen as like a shameful disease of poverty at that time. That's when Tanya told Nuria something she never talked about. Tanya had come to Cotty when she was 15, even younger than than, than Nuria. She'd been thrown out by her middle-class family because they thought it was insane that she loved punk. She made her way, she, she lived in a squat in Cotty and she got pregnant not long after she arrived. So they realised, Tanya and Nuria, that they, had, they were incredibly similar. They had mm. both been children who'd had children of their own in this place they didn't understand. Mm. These pairings were happening all over Cotty, right? Mm. Um, that there was um, a, a, a grumpy old white guy called Dieter who was paired with a young Turkish German lad called Mehmet who kept being told he'd nearly be thrown out of school because he, they said he had ADHD and Dieter started helping Mehmet with his schoolwork. Uh, directly opposite this housing project, there's a gay club that had opened about a year and a half before the protest called Zudblock, which is a quite kind of um, hardcore gay club. It's run by a man I love called Rick Hardstein and they... <laughs> But to give you an example of what it's like, that the previous place that Ricard ran was called Cafe Anal. Um, so it's, you know, and, and as you can imagine, you know, it's an area with a lot of religious Muslims. When the gay club was open, people were, some people were really angry. Some people had smashed their windows. Um, when the protest began, this club gave all their furniture to the protest, the barricade. And after it been going on for about six months, they said, you know, you guys should have your meetings in our club, we'll give you free drinks, we'll give you free food. And even the lefties at Cotty said, you know, we're not going to get these very religious Muslims to come and have meetings in a very extreme gay club. Yeah. But it did start to happen. One of the Turkish German women there said to me, we all realised we had to take these small steps to understand each other. Mm. And, and after the protest had been going on for a full year, the barricade was manned every minute, um, one day a guy turned up at Cotty um, named Tunkai. Uh, who had clearly been living homeless. Tunkai was in his early 50s. And when you meet Tunkai, it's clear that he's got um, some kind of cognitive difficulties. Um, but he had an amazing energy. He was really like warm and funny and people really loved him. And by this time, they had actually, because a lot of the people at Cotty are construction workers, they'd actually built, their barricade was a permanent structure in the middle of the road with a roof. It's really lovely. Um, and they said to, to, to Tunkai after a while, you know, we don't want you to be homeless. You should come and live in this thing we've built. We love you. We think oh. you're great. So Tunkai came to live there. And after he'd been there, and he became a much loved part of the Koti protest. And after he'd been there for about, um, I think it was nine months, one day the police came to inspect. They would do this every now and then. And Tunkai doesn't like it when people argue. So he went to try to hug one of the police officers, but they thought he was attacking them. Oh. So they arrested him. Oh. That was when it was discovered. Tunkai had been shut away in a psychiatric hospital for 20 years, often literally in a padded cell. One day he had escaped. He'd been on the streets for a few months and he found his way to Cotty. So the police took him back to this psychiatric hospital at the oh. other side of Berlin, at which point the entire Cotty protest turned into a kind of free Tunkai movement, right? They descended oh. on this psychiatric hospital. And I remember these psychiatrists being like, what is this? They've got this person they've had shut away for 20 years yeah. and suddenly they've got these women in hijabs, these very camp gay men and these punks yeah. demanding his release. But one of the people yeah. there, one of the protesters, Uli Hartman, said to the psychiatrist, yeah, but you don't love him. Oh. He doesn't belong yeah. with you. We love him. He belongs with us. I remember thinking when I heard that, how many of us, if we were carried away to a psychiatric hospital, mm would have hundreds of people saying, no, we look after this person. You don't do yeah. that, right? Yeah. And I remember, anyway, lots of things happened at Cotty. Uh, they got Tunkai back, it took a while. Um, they got uh, a rent freeze for their entire housing project. They then launched a referendum initiative to keep, to freeze rents in Berlin. It got the largest number of written signatures in the history of the city of Berlin. Mm -hmm. Berlin now has a rent freeze. But yeah. the last time I saw Nuria, I remember her saying to me, you know, I'm really glad I got to stay in my neighbourhood. That's great. 
but I gained so much more than that. I was surrounded by these amazing people all along and I would never have known. And I remember one of the, the Turkish German women there who was a big part of the protest, Neriman Tanker, said to me, you know, when I grew up in Turkey, I grew up in a village and I called my whole village home. And then I came to live in the Western world. I learned that here, what you're meant to call home is just your four walls. Mm. And if you're lucky, your family. And she said, when this protest began, she started to call all these people in this whole place her home. And she said, she told me, I thought it really stayed with me. She said to me, uh, sorry. She said to me, she realized that in some sense, in this culture, we are homeless. Mm. Your sense of home, our sense of home isn't big enough to me. You know, it, there's a, the, a wonderful Bosnian writer, Alexander Heyman, who said, home is where people notice when you're not there. Mm. And by that standard, we are homeless in this culture. Yeah. And to me, it was so clear to me, Cotty, these people, think about how unhappy they were, right? Nuria was about to kill herself. Tunkai was shut away in a padded cell. Mehmet was about to be thrown out of school for having ADHD. Loads of these people were depressed and anxious. In the main, they didn't need to be drugged. Yeah. They needed to be together. Yeah. They needed to be That's seen true. and valued. They needed to have a sense of purpose and meaning. And when you discover, and you're exactly right, that can only happen at the local level, right? Now, that, yeah. at the local level, you can make bigger changes. And at Cotty, they were a key part of what led to the change in the whole of Berlin, getting rent freezes, yeah. which is inspiring a movement all over Europe. So, you know, you can, the local can inspire the global. But if it hadn't been for that, lo that local reconnection yeah. with literally the people around them, I don't think that could have happened. And to me, that was a real illustration of the power of, lo of, of the local right and yeah. the power of being seen by the people around you yes. um and and you know i think you can tell that i love these people in Cotty. i think they're amazing but in many ways they're they're not exceptional right yes, they yeah. are random people they were just ex expressing the deepest needs of human beings and finding ways to get those needs met yeah so beautiful you have 